Okay, so welcome all of you to SAGAD and to the afternoon of the first day's program. Uh, I got the task of talking about principles of optics and lasers, and I got only a bit more than one hour to cover all these topics, which is a many years program. Uh, but I'm putting together some, some fundamentals of, of the field. So I thought that what I really want to talk about is lasers, what is a laser, and also to concentrate a bit on high energy short pulse lasers, because this is what the future ELI infrastructure will specialize in. So during this talk, I, wanna, I want you to learn a bit uh, about lasers. What is a laser? Laser is the word laser is an acronym. It stands for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. What it tells you is that this is a, a light source, a special light source. And this is what I'm going to tell you about. What is special about lasers? How they come about? How can we produce these uh, special uh, properties for the lasers? And what they can be used for? So where did the uh, story of laser begin? Uh, well, it began quite some time ago. In 1916, Albert Einstein put down the equations that uh, showed that uh, it is possible to produce uh, light with these very special properties. Uh, he founded the theory uh, for producing the lasers. But then, for a very long time, until 1960, this was just theory. No one could produce a source uh, that uh, produces uh, laser light. Uh, and then in 1960, Theodor Maimann managed uh, to make a laser, uh, to build a laser and to have it running. This was his laser. Later on I'll tell you the different parts, uh, how it worked. But by today, during these uh, uh, 100 or 50 years, lasers invaded our everyday life. Now if you look around, uh, there isn't a, an area of life where you wouldn't find a laser. Uh, you find lasers uh, in CD, DVD uh, players, in my pointer, there is a little laser, the barcode scanner, also in medicine, uh, lasers are used uh, very often. You can say in arts, producing holograms uh, is a use of laser, and also in show business, uh, they like to use lasers very often. And one photo I put here uh, about research, uh, this is what uh, so, by the end of this talk, I hope you will be all uh, able to answer these questions. What is a laser? What is its specialty? How the special properties are derived from uh, the way we build up the laser? What are the main components of the lasers? And what properties of the lasers qualify them in ideal two to be used in medicine? So, how do we build a laser? Well, uh, there are certain types of lasers commercially available. You just go to the shop and buy the laser. But if you need a special laser or if you want to see what's inside the box that you are buying, commercially available, this is what you, what you would see inside. This is like uh, building from Lego. Uh, you have different optical elements, uh, lenses, mirrors, uh, different, even more complicated wave plates and uh, crystals. And you have to put them into the right position, uh, right distance from the other one, along uh, straight lines, and then this whole setup can start working as a laser, it can emit the radiation that you want. Uh, the physical process behind laser is uh, the stimulated emission. This, is, uh, this also appeared in the acronym that I introduced you to before. Basically, if you, we have some material, we have, let's uh, simplify the atom and radiation and they interact uh, together, three basic processes can happen. The first one we call absorption. Absor absorption happens if you have two different energy levels of the system, of the atom, a ground state and an excited state, and a photon comes in that has exactly the same energy as the difference between these two energy levels, and then this, uh, the energy of this photon can be absorbed, leaving the material in an excited state. So this is one uh, possibility of interaction. The second one is called spontaneous emission. Here we have the atom in the excited state to start with, and then it can decay down to the ground state, emitting the excess energy in the form of the photon. 
So this is minus one photon process, this is plus one uh, photon process. And these are actually the processes that Einstein identified in 1916, uh, and he uh, figured out or he thought that there could be a third process. And in this third process, you have an incoming photon and you have the matter in the excited state. And as the income, at the income of this photon, this kind of initiates, induces, stimulates the decay of the atom to the ground state. You will, so you will have two photons moving out. So you had one in, two out. The main difference between spontaneous emission and stimulated emission is that with this incoming laser, the incoming light, incoming photon, it induces the uh, passage of the atom from the excited state to the ground state. So the two photons will be linked together, we say coherent, uh, a bit more uh, scientifically. So basically they will have the same properties and this way we, we have some input to the radiation that we can amplify uh, to, to produce more radiation. So this is the fundamentals of uh, lasers. Uh, as I said, laser is a light source. Uh, it produces light with special properties. Uh, every uh, law, every property that we have for light, uh, optics, is uh, valid for laser lights as well. So if they reach an interface, then they can be refracted or reflected. Uh, they can also be focused uh, by lenses or mirrors and they come in all different wavelengths and frequency ranges. The frequency and wavelength is uh, combined uh, in this equation which, keep, uh, which provides the speed of light which is a universal constant in vacuum and in each material uh, there is a factor uh, to divide by. So basically, as I said, laser is just a special light uh, produced uh, by uh, special properties. What are these special properties? I have a list here that uh, I'm going to show you in the next few slides. Uh, the most important property of laser light that people would tell you if you ask them is monochromaticity. This is a special word which means it has a single color. So white light or sunlight or the light of these uh, bulbs that uh, irradiate the room they cover the full uh, spectral range. Uh, we call visible light from the blue to the red. It spans uh, about uh, 400 nanometer to 700, 800 nanometers. But if we have a laser light, then it's very single colored, very much containing only a single frequency component or a single wavelength component. Uh, there are other ways to say monochromatic, uh, so one is single color, the other one we say it has a very narrow bandwidth, so the spectral width is very narrow. And if we have a very narrow bandwidth radiation, then it can be very coherent temporally, which means, this coherence property means that uh, the light can interfere, it has a fixed locked phase uh, behavior. So for example here, I have a, a, a cartoon showing uh, light which has very narrow bandwidth, therefore it's like a sinusoidal uh, oscillation, uh, infinity of time, uh, therefore the phase of one point and the phase of another point is locked. If we have a wider band uh, radiation, then it um, is often associated with phase jumps at certain time intervals, which means that the phase of one point and the phase of another point during time of this uh, electromagnetic wave is not locked anymore. So the interference between one part of the wave and another part is not uh, perfect. Another property of laser light is that it has a very small divergence, or in other words, it's parallel. We also say it's well collimated, so we have a beam which is really uh, comes in a, in a straight and uh, you could say uh, in, as if it was in a tube, but it's a free pop propagation. So, for example, this uh, beam I can point with it to a further uh, uh, plane, and still it would uh, only be uh, a very small spot 
because it's, it's not divergent. This is something you can't do with a torch. If you want to uh, lift the torch onto an object, then it very rapidly diverges. Laser lights is collimated, it, it can propagate in a, in a small uh, cross section for a long time. So here is an example how uh, if you have non-laser light, uh, you would focus it with a, uh, with a lens, you would always get a spot which is uh, comparable to the original size of uh, the radiation, whereas for laser light you can focus it to a very small spot size. Uh, and uh, before I said that the laser light was temporally coherent, which means that if you have emission from a laser source, uh, then uh, different parts in time of this uh, laser light would uh, interfere uh, with each other. Uh, we also talk about spatial coherence, so if we have uh, some light uh, emitted from a laser, then different parts of the wavefront, different spatial parts, they could be brought to interfere with each other, whereas for other light sources, uh, the phase is irregular spatially as well as temporal. Other special properties of laser light is uh, some of the lasers are tunable, which means they have a very well defined uh, wavelength, a very well defined color, but you can shift this color. This is uh, what we, we uh, call tunability. Also, laser light can be made to very short pulse durations. Later on, I'll give you some examples. But there are lasers, uh, laser pulses, laser impulses, that only last a few femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15 of a second, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So this is, this is a really short pulse that you can only produce uh, in, in lasers. A uh, few microseconds, you can have conventional flashes, to, to produce that uh, range of light just by applying the voltage uh, for a given time. But for very short pulses, you need lasers, you need uh, the, the above properties. And also, lasers can come in very high power. Uh, what it means high power is that you concentrate the energy of the light into a short time, because power is energy divided by time. So if it can be very short, it means it can be very intense, very dense, uh, can have a high power. Uh, I'll give you, I, I'll talk you through uh, how a laser is built, uh, the, the principles. So basically to have a laser, what you need is you need an oscillator. An oscillator is uh, uh, providing us with a very stable frequency. Time. So basically, an oscillator would be a pendulum as well, which swings back and forth with a very uh, well-defined uh, given frequency. This is something you can also do optically. So you can you can produce a very uh, well-defined uh, frequency of uh, radiation, uh, and it uh, goes on uh, for a long time. If we have a very well-defined oscillation, it means that in time it follows a sinusoidal pattern and it only contains one frequency component, F0. The bandwidth is very, very narrow. Uh, to have uh, this oscillation frequency uh, chosen, we have what's called the resonator. This is what produces, this is resonant to the frequency that the oscillator so it can be a very low loss uh, situation. Uh, here is an example. So if, as I said, a pendulum can provide us with a given frequency by swinging, uh, then it will oscillate sinusoidally. But because there are some losses of energy, uh, the energy is dissipated, so the amplitude of oscillation is decreasing with time. So basically this is what uh, a non-forced oscillation looks like uh, when there is no uh, compensation of losses, that it will just pick out its natural frequency, the resonators, uh, the oscillator's frequency, and then it will be reduced in time. And uh, if we look at what frequency components this radiation or this, well, this radiation, so 
this oscillation uh, contains, then you would see that the peak in frequency is uh, at uh, the given value, given by the length of the pendulum, but it's widened because of this, these losses. If you would uh, put in some energy continuously into this pendulum to overcome the losses uh, that it uh, loses just by its motion, you could keep up the sinusoidal oscillations uh, in the in the, in the, in the, in the, with a constant amplitude and in the spectrum of such an oscillation you only get a single component. So when you are thinking about building a laser you need some oscillation but you need to keep it on so you need to feed in some energy. So this is what an optical resonator looks like. We have uh, some mirrors that uh, bounces the light back and forth and basically the light goes around and the length of this cavity or uh, resonator defines what frequencies can be uh, present in this uh, optical resonator. Uh, the length of the cavity determines the frequencies. If you think about uh, vibrations on a string then uh, the different modes uh, that a string can produce of a given length is analogous to uh, the optical wavelengths, optical frequencies that can uh, be stable in a certain resonator. Uh, and here I illustrate if I have a, a string of length uh, L, then what are the wavelengths of uh, standing waves uh, that can be produced on this string. And you can see that these are different modes, different vibration uh, modes uh, that are resonant to the length of, uh, of the string that I have and uh, connecting wavelength frequency and the speed of the wave uh, gives us what frequencies can be produced in this, uh, in this string uh, that are resonant to the length. And uh, if we look at uh, what the spectral content uh, of such a, a system is, then what you will see that you have frequencies separated by uh, a given length, given by the, the total length of uh, the string. And since we have some losses of energy, some damping of the oscillation, each of these lines are a bit uh, wider. And this is exactly what happens in uh, a laser, in an optical oscillator as well. We have a certain length of this op oscillator. I showed you how light goes around. So this is one length of the, op uh, of the oscillator. And you have to fit an equal number of wavelengths of uh, the light into an oscillator. Now a typical oscillator is of the order of one meter length. That can be 30 centimeter, or it can be 5 meter, but it's an order of, uh, of 1 meter. And if you think about uh, the wavelength of light, it's a few hundred nanometers. So here I have a numerical example. What happens if you have uh, yellowish, greenish light, 500 nanometer? Then you can see that uh, the standing waves that can be produced in such an oscillator will have uh, frequencies that are separated by a few uh, times 10 to the 8 hertz. So actually these are very, uh, very densely uh, separated. So the separation of these wavelengths are very, uh, very dense. So there is not much uh, uh, difference in frequency between them. Uh, the, one of the, uh, the, the frequency of light that uh, we are trying to Amplify this 500 nanometer one uh, has a frequency, a central frequency of 6 times 10 to the 14, and compared to this, uh, the separation of peaks, separation of frequency peaks is, is really small. Uh, you can resolve it in, uh, in spectroscopy, but uh, it looks almost uh, continuous. Uh, so, 
do I, I'm getting to how our lasers can, laser can uh, be built together. Uh, but if you remember, I said that there are two processes, absorption and stimulated emission, that both involves the incoming photon and the matter. And if we have the matter in the ground state, when the photon comes in, then this, uh, this photon can be absorbed. And if we have the atom in an excited state, then uh, it might happen that there will be two photons out. So this is reducing the number of photons, and this is the increasing number of photons. So these are two competing mechanisms, uh, and uh, they both involve the interaction of light and matter. And one is to our advantage, increasing the number of uh, photons, the other is to disadvantage because of that would uh, lose us uh, one photon. We want to produce as much photons as possible. And uh, if you just think about logically, uh, the number of absorption events would be proportional to the number of ground state atoms. So atoms in the ground state. Whereas uh, the number of stimulated emission events would be proportional to the number of atoms in the excited state. So, Whoever wins, if it's absorption or stimulated emission, it will rely on how many atoms we have in the ground state or in the uh, excited state. And we all know that every system tends to go to the lowest possible energy uh, state, at least uh, towards equilibrium. So normally, in equilibrium, we have a much higher number of states in the ground state than in the excited state. So to make a laser, uh, we need uh, the oscillator that I've talked to you about in the previous few slides. But also what we need is, we need to put more atoms in the excited state than in the ground state. And this is not possible in, in equilibrium, in thermal equilibrium, but you have to pump in some energy so that you have a higher number of, uh, of atoms in the excited state. And this is what in, in laser uh, science is called population inversion. We have to invert the populations. We have to have more atoms in the excited state than in the ground state. And this is what we do uh, by putting in uh, some feeding some energy into the system. Uh, so basically, this is uh, what an equilibrium uh, state would look like. The higher the energy of the level of the system, the smaller the population, because most of the atoms would like to go down to the lowest energy uh, case, but to make a laser we need to produce something which is uh, inverted, that we have one energy level which is more populated than the one below us. So what usually happens is that you pump the system, you put some energy to bring it up to a higher energy state. There usually, it, it usually involves rapid decay to an intermediate level, and this is what we call the laser transition, where we can achieve higher density of states in, in this case than in the ground state. And the energy difference between these two uh, states would be given out in form of a photon. Uh, there are, uh, the material has to have an energy structure that allows uh, such And then uh, for stable operation of the laser, we need to have more photons generated than what is absorbed in each round of the medium. What usually happens is that you have this active medium or lasing medium, and you place it in between two mirrors or just inside the cavity, in, inside the resonator that I showed before, so there could be some mirrors around. Uh, actually, some are, actually, some are curved, uh, some are flat. And then the laser light is going back and forth between the two ends of uh, the cavity, two ends of the resonator. And each time it passes through the active material, the active medium, then uh, there it can achieve a higher number of photons, uh, uh, higher number of uh, photons than uh, the round before. And uh, the three processes, the spontaneous emission, stimulated emission, absorption, they all happen continuously and there is a balance between these three that we want to achieve. We want to have as much as possible of the stimulated uh, 
photons and not the spontaneous one, and uh, we want as little as possible from the absorption processes. Uh, this cartoon gives you an idea how a laser is being built up. So from the time that we switch on the system, usually it happens very quick. But this, these are the steps that uh, the laser goes through. So we start with having a, an active medium, a lazy medium, with, inside uh, the cavity. And originally, all atoms are in the ground state. This is what these uh, blue dots uh, indicate, that all atoms are in the ground state. And then you start putting some external energy in. This is uh, to create the population inversion. And there are different methods to achieve. I'll uh, come back to it later. And some of the atoms become now purple instead of uh, the blue ones, and they are now indicated atoms in the excited state. Uh, since atoms in the excited state can decay spontaneously to the lower level, uh, we start seeing some uh, radiation emitted by these excited atoms. This is just spontaneous emission that uh, comes from the excited atoms. And then this light is then propagated to the mirror, it's reflected, and it goes back and forth between the ends, uh, passing through the lazy medium. And if this uh, light would hit an excited atom, then you would produce, then you would uh, induce uh, stimulated emission, and then this leads to a rapid increase in, in light uh, intensity. Increasing uh, the energy in uh, the light beam. And one end mirror is only partially reflective, which means some light is uh, leaking through, and this is on purpose, not because the mirror is not good enough. And this light which is leaking through this mirror is actually the laser beam that we can use. So this is, this is our light to be used. Whatever is inside the cavity, we need that light to keep up lasing operation. Uh, but some of it, usually it's, it's around a percent, sometimes 10 percent, but usually it's less than a percent of the light which falls onto this end mirror is leaked through, and this is, this is for our use. Uh, from the process that uh, produces us the laser light, uh, we could see what are the main components of the lasers that we need, uh, this uh, pink, uh, part is called the active material, laser material, and it can come in different uh, forms. It can be gas, it can be liquid, it can be a solid, and it's there to, to amplify the light. Uh, this um, lightning bolt uh, indicates that we need some pumping, we need to put the energy in. Basically, the energy is needed to create and maintain population and pumping can come in different forms as well. It can be uh, electric current, it can be an intense light, uh, it can be a chemical reaction which uh, produces uh, atoms in the excited state. And then we have the two end mirrors which provide, pro which, uh, build, which uh, gives us uh, the optical resonator. And one of the mirrors is uh, perfect. We want to have 100% reflection. So it's almost 100, and the other one is partially reflector, that's the outcoupling uh, part of uh, the oscillator. And when I say partially reflecting, one to a uh, few tenths of a uh, percent is uh, what is uh, transmitted uh, through, and uh, this is actually not a loss, this is the laser that uh, we are using. Additional to this, there are some uh, other elements that we have laser, the voltage supply, if, it's, uh, if the population inversion is uh, created through some electrical process, control knobs, uh, very often you need a cooling system because uh, the active material can heat up. If it's a very high average power system, then even the mirrors can heat up, so they need some cooling. So when you end up having a laser, it has some additional uh, parts as well, but these are the main components which are necessary for the laser to place. Uh, the first laser, uh, as I said, uh, was uh, started in 
started training in 1960 by Theodor Maimann, and uh, I like this example very much because I can point out the main ingredients to you. So this uh, pinkish rod, it's a ruby rod, and this is the active material, the laser material. And actually, the way he made uh, the resonator is that he evaporated some metal onto the two ends of the rod, which was very uh, nicely polished, very flat surface. And evaporating some uh, reflective material on it actually uh, created the resonator itself. And then you see this spiraling uh, glass tube around, and this is a flash tube. This is what produced the population inversion. So in this discharge tube, where you connect the voltages, you produce uh, some light, very intense light that, that pumps the ruby rod in the center uh, to population inversion. So this is how simple a laser can look like. Uh, I'll uh, give you some properties uh, of the components that now are all, all familiar with, but uh, they are needed for. P probably the most important uh, part of the laser is the laser medium, called the active medium. And this is uh, actually, uh, as I said, needed for the laser process. And the choice of the active medium depends on what kind of laser you want to, uh, want to produce. Uh, each uh, material can laser, can produce light at a specific uh, wavelength in certain spectral ranges because the material has to have the energy transition uh, which is uh, which provides uh, the photon energy uh, associated with, with that color associated with that uh, wavelength so I have here just a few uh, examples of what uh, active medium can be used uh, to provide a certain CO2 laser uh, at 1 micron, 1,000 nanometer is uh, an example. Argon laser works in the UV and, uh, and so on. And depending on what you want to use your laser for, that will define the wavelengths uh, that you want the laser to laser. The active medium can be, as I said, of different materials. It can also come in different consistencies. It can be gas. Probably the most known gas uh, lasers are CO2 lasers and Heli lasers. Heli laser is a mixture of helium and neon in the tube. So basically you have a tube and you fill up this tube uh, with the gas or gas mixture that, that you want. And one end of the gas tube you have cathode and the other you have the anode and you uh, connect some high voltage onto it and uh, electrically you bring uh, the atoms or, or molecules of this gas to an excited state and then there is some, uh, this is the blazing uh, transition for uh, the heating laser. Uh, there can be different types of gases. Uh, some uh, lasers use noble gases or mixtures of noble gases. Uh, can be ionic, so ions are uh, excited and they provide uh, the lasers. You can have molecules in gas lasers, you can have matter vapors, you can have neutral atoms. And there is a special class of uh, gas lasers that are called excimer lasers. Excimer stands for excited dimer. This is a molecule which is formed from two species at least one of uh, which is in, in the excited state. So this molecule doesn't exist in a uh, ground state. This is a very nice trick to achieve population inversion because if uh, the uh, molecule would, would decay down to the ground state, it immediately dissociates because it's not a stable form of the molecule. So basically the ground state is empty. You only have uh, molecules in the excited state. So this is how uh, you achieve uh, population inversion. The second type of uh, the consistency of uh, laser medium is if you choose liquid. When you have a liquid uh, 
laser. Uh, this is often called dye laser because you have uh, the active medium in a solution, in a dye solution. And uh, here I have a few dyes that are used in lasers and uh, I have the spectra that can be covered with, uh, with such a dye. And you can see that they are reasonably wide. So I don't know how well you can see these numbers, but from 400 to 950, it goes up. So relatively, you can see that each dye covers a certain range uh, of wavelength that, can, that it can be uh, tuned to, uh, to, to amplify in the laser. So this is why la dye lasers are very frequently Used because of that tunability. So you have you set up the laser. You have uh, in in a cubette you have the active medium, and just by optically tuning the resonator, uh, you can change the wavelength. You don't have to go and find another uh, active medium if you want to have some uh, spectral line. Uh, this is what it looks like if you have a dye laser. So as I said, in a cubette. You put the, the solution uh, that you are using, and depending on what color you want your laser, it has a different color actually just by, by looking at it. This is two examples, Rodan 6G and Coumarin. You can see how different the color can be. This is orangey, this is uh, bluish, and the laser light that you produce uh, will have a very different wavelength. Uh, the way uh, a dye laser is usually pumped is by another uh, light, another uh, beam, uh, very often another laser. So basically you would have one mirror at one end, another mirror at the other end, and between the two uh, you have the pivot with the solution and you pump with uh, another light beam. Uh, often you focus this light beam with a cylindrical lens which provides you a line in the focus, it, it's just a line. So actually in this uh, volume, uh, you have the, the, the atoms, the dye, not actually the dye molecules, uh, pumped up to the excited state and then uh, they will be amazing. Just a few examples of, uh, of dyes. The third class of lasers uh, is uh, solid state lasers. They have a very simple architecture. As I said, with the ruby laser, you just take a rod made up of ruby, usually with some doping. You polish the ends, and uh, it's, it's very easy to, to handle. Uh, and uh, the pumping up is often done uh, using another light. Pump it up, then you lose some energy, uh, and you always get a lasing at uh, longer wave, like uh, smaller photon energy than what you pumped it to. Now, a question may arise once I have the laser to pump it up to a higher state, it can be laser or it can be just a uh, flash tube. Uh, why would bother to pump another laser with this laser, the first laser? Had. And then the, uh, uh, the answer is that the second laser often have different properties. It, it, is often, it often comes in a shorter pulse uh, or it can be made uh, tunable. Uh, so there are, uh, there are reasons to use a laser to pump another laser uh, because the second laser would have uh, some beneficial properties, the third one. The th first one. Uh, probably the most widespread lasers have an, a, a, a laser medium uh, in front of the diode and uh, they are very well spread because they are very cheap, they are very small, they are very reproducible. Commercially, you can buy laser diodes from 375 nanometer to 1.8 micron uh, at virtually any wavelength. And, uh, as I said, they are small, they are cheap, so if you don't need a lot of energy, you would probably uh, buy a uh, diode laser. 
And probably the most recent direction for producing lasers is the fiber lasers. Uh, in the fiber laser, the active uh, medium, the laser medium, is actually a doped optical fiber, so it's uh, already in the fiber. The light propagates in this active medium. Uh, a fiber, an optical fiber, can be uh, rolled up, so it can be this laser can be of a very compact size and still a very long medium, providing uh, a very large gain. High intensity pulses. Uh, and since the light is uh, generated in this uh, optical fiber, it's already able, it's already ready to be uh, steered to the application that you want to use your laser for. So, the basic uh, components of the laser, active medium, I think I've said what I want say about what kind of active mediums you can have. The second one is pumping. As I said, pumping is required to produce this uh, population inversion. So in form of pumping, you put the energy in, into the laser, by uh, increasing the number of excited state uh, constituents in the system. Uh, it can be done using a discharge. So you put a uh, high voltage between an anode and a cathode and there is a spark, and this uh, spark can induce population inversion. Uh, it can be on, in, of a uh, flash lamp, so there is a, some light flashed uh, in this uh, tube surrounding the active medium, uh, and this light that the flash, very intense light produced in the flash, is absorbed by the medium and by absorbing this uh, energy brought up the population version. But I also said that you can uh, use another light to pump up the system. So for example, for fiber lasers, uh, you can use a laser diet to pump it up the population inversion. You can even use a diet array. But uh, you can also use chemical reaction to feed the system, to bring uh, the active medium up to as I said before, you can even use a pump laser, pumping laser, to pump up your system. Uh, this is uh, schematics uh, of the arrangement of a laser system. You have a laser at 532 nanometer, pumping the active medium. And then, this is the green light, and whatever passes through is then being blocked. That's, uh, Lose. So some of it is absorbed in the active medium. And then we have uh, the resonator. This mirror one is one end mirror of the resonator. And then the light, the red light, which will be the laser light that we are producing, is uh, coming all the way to the end of this other flat mirror, which is also called OC, optic uh, outcoupler. Uh, so this is where uh, about a percent or less of the light is leaking through and this is the laser light that you want to produce. Uh, such a system we have here at the university and uh, we have a very high power green laser to pump the system. We have a Tyne-Zap crystal, titanium sapphire crystal, which is pumped up by this uh, and it produces light at eight, around 800 and why do we use all the green laser energy? Because the pass length that we can produce with the, in this green laser, it's very long. And we want to have very short pulses. We want to, uh, the, the pulse duration between one and the other can be a million times less for, this, uh, for the laser that we so we pay the price because the pass energy for this green laser is higher, but it uh, comes in a shorter burst. Uh, 